Uh, my name is Chris or Christy. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm on the team at DBase, which is a DIY community art space in Toronto's Chinatown. Uh, so over the past few months, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with Myzeum and Nightingale Nguyen on our quarantine capsule project. Uh, but before we begin our program, I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that we are on here in Toronto. Toronto, or Takaranto, is Treaty 13 territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, of the Anishinaabe, as well as the Haudenosaunee, the Patoon First Nations, and the Wendat. They are the Indigenous, ancestral, traditional, and contemporary caretakers of these lands, airs, and waters. I'd like to share an acknowledgement written by Jill Carter, an Indigenous faculty member of the University of Toronto. Zoom has erected the, its headquarters in San Jose, California, while Skype has erected one key arm of its operations in Palo Alto, California. This is the traditional territory of the Mukamakma Ohlone tribal nation. Current members of this nation are direct descendants of the many missionized tribal groups from across the region. We who are able to connect with each other via via Zoom or Skype are deeply indebted to the Mwekma Ohlone people and the lands and waters they continue to steward. Now support the people, pipelines and technologies that carry our breath, words and images across vast distances to others. As we meet through Zoom, let us personally acknowledge the debt we have incurred and that, it, and that is amassing each time we open our laptops. We are all indebted to those peoples and communities whose waters and lands have been poisoned as a result of the extraction of metals and rare earth elements required to fabricate the machinery through which we speak to, hear from, and view each other. We are indebted to those people whose working lives, youth, and vitality have been spent in unsafe spaces and intolerable conditions so that many citizens of the so-called developed world might have easy access to these and related devices. As we encounter each other each day through our email accounts, our messaging apps, our vital our virtual meetings rooms and chat rooms, let us strive to remain mindful of the incalculable debt we owe. Before I pass the mic on, let's take a minute to think about how a few of the indigenous communities that are on the front lines for environmental and racial justice and sovereignty across Turtle Island. Let us think about the Wet'suwet'en and their fight against the coastal gas link pipeline Let's think about the Swetmik people's fight against the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Let's think about the Six Nations of the Grand Rapids and their defense of traditional territory at 1492 Land Back Lane. Let's think about the Algonquins' call for a moose moratorium to protect declining moose populations. Let's think about the fight against the municipality of Oka's non-consensual architectural dig, no archaeological dig, and reappropriating of the pines as a settler colonial site on. Kanyan Kahaka territory. And let us think about the Mi'kmaqi people over on the East Coast exercising their treaty right to fish for lobsters for moderate livelihood and the violent attacks against them and their facilities and the RCMPs and federal government who stand by and allow this all to happen. And thank you to my T-Base teammate, Arezu, who has sourced a lot of this information from the Instagram accounts at Fridays for Future TO and at Decolonize Myself, which will be linked in the chat. COVID times have impacted all of us financially in different ways, but if you have funds to spare, please consider supporting these indigenous communities and activist groups. Thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it over to Nadine to say a few words. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for such a thoughtful start to tonight's program. Uh, my name is Nadine Villiasine Feldman. I'm the director of programming at Myzeum. My pronouns are she, her, they. Uh, for those of you who are new to Myzeum of Toronto, we are a museum without walls that aims to tell the stories and narratives, past, present, and future of our city through programs, events, experiences, uh, exhibits across the city, and of course through uh, online programs such as this one tonight. Um, we'd like to welcome you to our event this evening, Quarantine Capital, Archiving Asian Canadian Stories. Tonight's discussion will focus on the significance of Chinatowns in our everyday life and the importance of archiving Asian Canadian stories. Um, and we're so pleased uh, to be partnering with our lead community partner, 
uh, on this uh, program as well as on our upcoming quarantine capsule digital exhibit. Um, uh, so thank you TBase uh, for, for bringing this wonderful opportunity to work together to Myceum. Um, and uh, of course you've met our moderator for this evening, Chris Carrier, uh, and we will also be joined by panelists, Nightingale Nguyen, Keith Locke, and Joshua Aries. Um, so before we begin, we just have a few Zoom tips uh, to ensure uh, the best possible experience for you in tonight's program. Um, our first tip is in order to view all speakers and ASL interpreters on the same screen, uh, there is a Zoom button on the top right corner of your screen where you can select view options and uh, you can select gallery view to see everyone. Um, please feel free to message the ASL interpreters directly if you re require assistance. Um, closed captions are also available for this program and to turn them on there is a closed caption button on the bottom of your Zoom screen um, and you should be able to click on that and click show subtitles. Um, we invite you to use the Q&A button also at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to ask questions um, and, and feel free to be putting your questions in throughout the program. Uh, there will be a Q&A sec uh, section at the end of the program. Um, and finally, um, there is also the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom, bottom center of your Zoom screen. Um, and this is where you can interact with the panelists, um, be in conversation with your fellow attendees, uh, and our staff will also be using the chat box to provide you with um, resources, uh, descriptions, links that will help you um, take a deeper dive into some of the material that will uh, and, and content that we'll be discussing today. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're going to begin the program. And to begin, we're going to show a short excerpt from Keith Locke's 1983 document about Toronto's Chinatown. Uh, this documentary was originally part of a series of documentaries for CBC TV called Neighborhoods. And this was the first film about the Chinese community written and directed by a member of the community. visions of dragon dances, great restaurants, warm people, and some of the most unusual shopping around. But it's even more than that. What tremendous changes we've seen in the last decade. Vitality, growth, a stronger sense of community than ever. These things are part of Chinatown's vibrant spirit. Off the Dundas Strip on the side streets exist some of the oldest residential sections in the city. Here Chinese and non-Chinese residents live on the tree-lined streets. Chinatown is like no other neighborhood in the city, for it is really a small city within a city. The shopping in this neighborhood is unsurpassed, catering as it does to the needs of the frugal and quality conscious Chinatown shoppers. Chinatown, it's color, culture, fabulous food, wonderful people. Maybe there is a little bit of mystery to the place, but its vibrancy and fine spirit are very, very real. And yes, for so many of us, once we enter these streets, whether to shop, eat, or just to enjoy life, it's home. Hello again. Uh, so before we dive in, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and say a bit about who they are and maybe a bit about why they got involved with Quarantine Capsule. Uh, so why don't we start off with Nightingale. Hi, thank you, Chris. 
I'm Nightingale. I'm the project lead of the quarantine capsule. I'll be referring to it as the QQ for short. I just got involved with it simply because I was questioning where it, it where our history is documented during this time as I really was curious about the Asian Canadian history throughout Canada. Thank you. Hey, you did more than get involved. You It's your brainchild. Um, and do you want to pass it on to Keith? Yes, Keith, take it away. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Keith Locke. I'm a filmmaker. And, um, uh, you know, it, I've been, it just blows my mind that, that this is being put on and that people are interested in, in Chinatown. I, I just remember, you know, when I was a teenager, uh, they were gonna, they were just gonna bulldoze Chinatown because they said it was an eyesore. So it, it's always in the past been a place that nobody wanted to go to uh, except, uh, you know, the community and the community was very, um, you know, it was like two worlds and, um, you know, the alternate world. If you were sick and the Western doctor couldn't help you, uh, you could go to Chinatown and, and get help and it would work. Um, so anyways, it's, uh, it just blows my mind that uh, people are, are interested in this topic and, and doing so well with it. Oh uh, yeah, that's so like mind blowing to me that it's considered an eyesore by anyone. Like even just going by your video, it's so like visually beautiful to me. Um, and I finally, uh, we should pass it to Josh. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Josh Aries. I'm a filmmaker based in Vancouver, Canada, and I enjoy making action films. I I've had like a great time during quarantine, actually just making my own stuff, working with the things I have access to. And I will be talking a lot about archiving Asian voices and why it's so important to me. So yeah, I'm very honored to be here. I can't believe you guys actually asked a Trump like me to <laughs> be very, very like, uh, to be a, 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 a source of insight for this whole thing. So I'm really honored. So yes, thank you for having me. Nice. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, Nightingale, do you want to bring us down your kind of origin story of why you started the QQ and like what the QQ is? Do we even have time to go through the entire origin story? I'm joking. Here's a summary. <laughs> I think that I'll be bringing in little elements and core thoughts as to as we go along. So this was a reaction to the pandemic. This, I, it's very obvious that this pandemic, it's going to be in the history books. There is no doubt about it. And so it led me to question where are Asian Canadians during this time, it led me to question where are Asian Canadians in general throughout history, other than just small tidbits and just repeated histories of exclusion all the time. And so I wanted to be able to take control of the narrative, to reclaim our narrative, to also create a safe space, a space of hope, a beacon of happiness so that way when we question what are we going to remember during this time it is the fact that we took control and that we did something great together and to use art as a intimate authentic way to express ourselves is just a good place to store our memories mm -hmm. yeah and like for a project that's so video based a lot of this the point of this is the the self-narration um, the documentation of history, like coming from our own voices. Um, so I'm wondering about, you know, as filmmakers and performers, like how, like your perspective on this idea of, of the voice and self-narration. Um, so if you wanted to like each go around and maybe give your thoughts on that. And maybe start with Josh, since you went last last time. Uh, yeah, sure, for sure. Uh... Sorry, what was the question again? Can you like say it again, right? Um, I was just trying to ask you from your perspective as a filmmaker specifically about this idea of, of self-narration, kind of what Nightingale was touching on uh, in terms of, um, you know, this is going to be documented. This is going to be in the history books. So kind of yeah. like who's, whose voice is going to be in the history books, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I really like the idea of self-narration throughout this whole process because 
that idea of self-narration is just working with the things that you have in the moment. You have a story, you have an idea, you have a camera, or you have a microphone. That's just something that, that's, a, that, that's just like a catalyst for making something awesome, basically for this whole world to see. And this thing had happened during the pandemic too, when they you know, obviously when resources are so like slim and when you're just forced to be at home, what else can you do? Well, mm -hmm. you, you can self narrate. You can tell a story about your experiences during the quarantine. And yeah, just archiving those voices during this whole time when, when, when we look back at this in the textbooks and everything, that's just so awesome. It's so important. And just showing, just using some self narration again, just shows the resourcefulness of us as a community, as, as a group of filmmakers and the artists and everything. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> and I know you've been making a lot of like films throughout the pandemic. Um, so do, do you want to tell us a bit about those and how you've had to shift your practice through? Oh yeah, for sure. So before the pandemic, I actually focused a lot on like action films and you know martial arts cinema and everything. So I work with large crews, uh, lots of lo lots of stunt performers, lots of like contact and being close to people. But when the pandemic hit, obviously we were we were kind of cut off with resources and everything. We we're kind of were forced to like, you know, work with ourselves. So I kind of wanted to didn't really want to sit still and wait for this whole thing to blow over. I kind of wanted to make my own stuff. So I started, I did actually start making my own stuff, starting with uh, Five Fingers of Fury, which uh, is a sh short film, action film that, that features my fingers fighting like this. You'll, you'll probably <laughs> see it somewhere around. Actually, if you can pull up the video, you could probably take a look at it. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, it will, it will come off very shortly. But basically, I wanted to take my time during this quarantine to be, serve as like an inspiration for people during, uh, in, who are stuck in a hard time during quarantine to work with what you have and, you know, just stress the idea that all you need to uh, tell a story really is a camera, an awareness of what you have and what you can work with. And most importantly, an idea or mm -hmm. like something that has like a beating heart in it and something you really want to tell the world. Or in this case, for me during quarantine is just to have fun, you know? Sure, it kind of sucks out there right now. I kind of want to take my mind off things. I want to make people laugh or I want to you know, show people that you can do crazy stuff during quarantine like this. So yeah, I just want to serve... I just wanted to be able to serve people in my own way through quarantine by, through my films. Nice. Yeah. Um, Keith, do you have anything to say about uh, the concept of self-narration from your perspective as a filmmaker? Yes, it's, 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 it's really important. Um, I remember uh, when I, I was doing films on the community and I would go into the archives, historical archives looking for footage and there'd be almost no footage, almost no photographs because people didn't think it was important enough or for some reason they never took photographs in the community um, like outsiders. So um, this is so important to, uh, to, to tell our own stories and, and to tell our own realities and, and to have other, you know, to show other people and just as a record and to record this moment because, um, you know, the camera doesn't lie. It, 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 picks up everything and it tells the truth. So um, um, it's, it's really, I feel it's really important and this is a wonderful um, project and opportunity for people and our community too. Yeah, like the, the, it's kind of crazy to think that all these videos from the submissions are gonna be um, ideally basically living on the Myzeum online virtual archive forever you know, like a, you know, time capsule idea. Um, Nightingale, do you want to talk a bit about the submissions? Like what kind of, can you summarize, you know, the variety of videos? There's so many that we have. Um, and just kind of like that process of, you know, what type of videos we have and like why we're including all of them. So like what you said, there is going to be a whole lot of variety from all different walks of life and Honestly, I think it all comes from the jury process. The jury process was just something so simple. We just wanted people to follow the guidelines and then we just accepted as many as we could. And we accepted more than what we originally thought. So people can expect a bit of everything. As you saw in the sneak peek, that's only a small portion. That's just the tip of the iceberg, guys. So once you see the digital exhibit come out, it is tenfold something crazy and different. Mm -hmm. So that's something to look forward to. Stories, art, 
it is all authentic expression of people's experiences during this time. Everyone's living realities that illustrate the culture and our cultural resilience during this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because one thing I appreciate about the selection we have is that it's not necessarily all about COVID. Um, it's really just like little snapshots into, into people's lives, uh, which, I, which I find is really interesting. Um, so to move on, I know that Nightingale, you are in um, the short film Wuhan Toronto recently, which addresses the effects that the pandemic ha has had across um, the world, basically uh, kind of comparing Wuhan and Toronto. Um, can you tell us a bit about that film, like the themes and your experience making it? Well, before I can start talking about the film, let's pull up the clip for, for that film, please. So Wuhan Toronto is essentially a film where it talks about isolation from the perspectives of two different girls. I play the one in Toronto and my co-star Carmen is playing the one in Wuhan. So Carmen is in Wuhan and she is stuck in her apartment. Whereas my character, I face a lot of discrimination, which leaves me isolated in the city that I can walk around. And so Wuhan Toronto is actually one of the few inspirations for the quarantine capsule, the QQ, as I wanted to be able to create a community project out of isolation where we can all bring something together and have our pieces, our truths essentially connect together in unity online. So that's where one of the inspirations for the QQ came from. And another one is also the fact that it makes you realize that we need to start taking our narrative seriously. We need, because we are the insiders and we can't let someone, you know, dictate our history at the same time. And it pretty much gave me the confidence to push forward with the QQ project. Nice. Um, yeah, so the I think the whole point of QQ has really been, um, for me at least, to, you know, build bridges across Asian Canadian communities um, and, and strengthen bonds when we can't, we can't really be there in person, when we don't really have a physical space. Um, and I think that the experience represented in, in Wuhan, Toronto is very relatable to a lot of Asian Canadians or Asians in North America in general. Um, especially those who may have family in Asia. Um, so just kind of like experiencing that disconnect and that, um, you know, isolation from across the world. Um, so I was going to ask, like, in your experience, like how have um, your ties to your cultural community impacted your work? Um, and has it had a, an impact on, um, on yourself as well, outside of your work too? Um, Nightingale, that was directed at you. Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, with Wuhan Toronto, it pretty much really kicked me in the butt and said like, okay, I need to start speaking up for my community. I need to start paying more attention to my community spaces. As the minute the pandemic hit, I saw barely no foot traffic in Chinatown. So I knew that our cultural spaces are being affected and it definitely has impacted a lot of my work into being more purposeful and practicing more self-documentation, especially when I saw so many sourdough bread making videos and I just wanted, you know, all of us to put it in a place where we can all look back and find something fun and relatable to. Thanks. Um, Keith, do you actually wanna talk a little bit about kind of the same topic of, um, you know, your connection over, over your career? Uh, to Chinatown, I know you were saying um, it was some. You were saying before something that you don't necessarily um, associate with back then. Um, do you want to speak a bit about how that's maybe evolved? Yeah, um, I didn't. I I I was trying to get away from it for a long time in my life and in my work, and then I um, I was asked to do work on this neighborhoods uh, film uh, series and. Um, I lived actually was living in Greek town at the time. So they assigned me the Greek community and then they figured out, oh, okay, well, let's give him Chinatown. So I went to Chinatown and it was like going home again. 
like a lot of people I went to talk to, they remembered me when I was a little kid. They remembered my dad who had a drugstore in Chinatown. And, um, and it was like going home. And then I did, I started thinking about it. I had, it gave me a perspective, started to, I had to have a perspective on the community. And I found out stuff which, uh, you know, I was just shocked. Like my dad couldn't vote because the Chinese couldn't vote. At, you know, and I was shocked. I was really shocked. I, you know, go and talk, well, dad, why didn't you vote? How, how would they know? Oh, they would know. And then they'd kick your butt, you know? Um, so it, it really opened my eyes and it gave me a perspective. And I, I started seeing the community um, in, in a context that I hadn't looked at before. I had started making this film about it. And um, it's just making those connections. And it was very, it was very, um, it solidified my, my, my personality or my work or something. It just gave me the perspective that I really was lacking because I'd been trying so hard to get away from it. And then I was, you know, so it was quite, a, it made quite a difference for me. And um, yeah, it's very important. And I think it is for everyone to have, to understand their identity and to work with it as filmmakers in any, in any capacity at all, like in any, um, fragment it's it's very valuable mm -hmm. and you said that it was like going home so did you grow up in chinatown um i didn't live in chinatown but my dad um he he was um he had a drugstore and he was he was one of the founders of the monshong home for the aged oh. because there were all these old bachelors that didn't have any family and so um so he would have his be at the store from 10 to eight. And then after eight o'clock, he would be working with uh, making the Monchong, you know, uh, working on that. So he would never see the kids. So he said, okay, you've got to come to the store. So from the age of seven, I was in Chinatown at my dad's store after school. And uh, so I saw, you know, a lot of things and um, it was quite, uh, you know, it was quite uh, amazing at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was there. I was there, but I didn't live. I didn't live in Chinatown, but I was there mm -hmm. every day almost. Yeah. So you, so you must know it very well. Um, I know the Chinatown from that time in the nineteen sixties. You know, uh, where it was. It was. There's just. Uh, it was an unbelievable. Uh, thing because a drugstore it it everybody came in and there was like on one side oh there's just so much going on like it was just amazing and all it was it was like full of outsiders not just Chinese but uh, you know um, just really uh, really interesting so are you able to like compare like the differences between back then and now yeah. Um, well, back then, because there was a lot of um, the, uh, dis I guess I could call it discrimination, like, um, you know, for a while, uh, banks would not loan money to Chinese people, you know, so the, the, the community had to make their own banks. So they would have this system of lending money, and they didn't charge interest. And you had to, you know, if you didn't pay it back, uh, you'd be nobody like, you know, you had to pay it, you know, and, and um, it was just um, uh, things like, you know, the Chinese, they had to take care of themselves. If you call the police, if there is a problem in your restaurant and you call the police, they wouldn't show up. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember, you know, being in a restaurant and something happened and the cook had to come out with his cleaver and, you know, uh, deal with it and that was the way that was the way it was back in the day in those mm -hmm. days yeah so so we were, it was very independent like um you know you, they solved their own problems and um you know we're very uh, very um trust everybody trusted and the trust was very important um yeah 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 and it's kind of hard to you know, imagine what it must have been like at that time, um, you know, coming from a perspective where, you know, I'm only 
only recently becoming more familiar with Chinatown. Um, Josh, I know you have kind of a, a different perspective. You're in Vancouver. Um, do you want to speak a little bit of uh, kind of your community over there or your experiences with cultural communities? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Actually, my experiences with uh, Chinatown actually stems way back when I was born in Thailand, actually. Uh, the Chinatown in Thailand, I remember, I actually remember more fondly than like I actually have in Vancouver because I, there lots of good memories back in Thailand, you know, just going over there, I mean, the sights and the smells and, you know, the, the great, uh, the great uh, parade that they have every, in, in Chinese New Year and everything. And I remember it just being like in another world, especially back, especially since I'm like in Asia, in Thailand. And it's another type of Asia back in Thailand too. So it was super interesting. And um, yeah, I felt like I, I spent more time in Chinatown back in Thailand than I did here in Vancouver for some reason. And Vancouver, yeah, for some reason, I don't really visit it too much for some reason. I think it's not really like been ingrained in me to actually go visit it too much. Cause, uh, but the only times I would actually go visit Chinatown really is actually to go visit like the nightclub there <laughs> in Fortune. <laughs> Uh, all, all the Vancouver rights where you probably know what that is. It's a, uh, but really like, yeah, I, I, I don't really have much like experience visiting Chinatown too much or actually like, you know, interacting with it too much. But I remember seeing a lot of like um, racism, especially during this time around that area where they, they spray paint over like the lions that would be guarding the, the whole um, gate too, which really like was not cool. Obviously it was, mm -hmm. it was a very uh, latent hate crime and everything too. And I frankly don't really see too much of like, you know, rallying to kind of like help keep it non-gentrified too much. I might be wrong. I don't know. I might not be too aware of that too much, but in my perspective here, like I don't really see it too, too much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, aside of just like Chinatowns, um, because I think uh, from my perspective, at least um, I wanted QQ to kind of help uh, bring together um, not just people who are physically in Chinatown, but maybe if you're, out more in the suburbs or if you're like you know I keep saying like oh that Asian kid who's in that all-white school and they want to be part of it and, oh know, yeah yeah kind yeah. of like bringing together those connections of um, cultural community because I think that's important um, do you have like maybe not Chinatown but something uh, similar that impacts you do you think uh, a place that's similar to Chinatown for me specifically well maybe not like a place but just like a connection to community that impacts you or impacts your work Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, growing up in Vancouver, uh, in Vancouver, more specifically Surrey, uh, it's a very Asian area compared to the rest of like, you know, Vancouver. Vancouver in general is very Asian, but I feel Surrey is very, very Asian because there's lots of Filipinos there like myself. There's lots of Indian, there's lots of uh, different walks of life. And I feel like the place where I am, Guilford, is, is just so like, it's, it's, just, it's, where I, it's where I draw from a lot of my experiences for my films and also for like, life in general because me frankly I can't imagine growing up in a place that's full of like a uh, part of my language like, like like white white people and everything right I, I didn't really grow up in a school full of like white people it was full of Asian full of all this uh full of, like, yeah full of people I'm very comfortable with you know and uh yeah sh shout out to Guilford I see you in the chat <laughs> and uh yeah like yeah, I would have been a completely different person, I felt, you know, and I definitely wouldn't have been as comfortable being like the only Asian kid in my class. I'm sure like a lot of people felt that. But in our place, it's like, oh, that's the only white kid in there. So like we were kind of we were definitely in the majority here in uh, Guilford in Surrey. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, we were having a conversation before and um, I think Nightingale and I expressed that, um, you know, we like we grew up over Toronto area and like there was less Asian kids maybe at our school and there was a difference in the histories that we were learning. Uh, I think you were saying you learned in school like about internment camps, Japanese internment camps and such. And, you know, I didn't have the same experience. So yeah, I think, that's nuts, right? Yeah. It's crazy. Like, yeah, I remember definitely learning about that stuff, but then apparently you guys didn't actually learn it at all. That's, that's crazy. I guess there was a little shift there between, cause I think there's definitely more like the Jap uh, more like Japanese, uh, culture here more more Asians I guess than Toronto I'm not too familiar with the, the the makeup of Toronto with how many people like what kind of uh how many Asians and how many different walks of life are there though so yeah mm -hmm. yeah and like I think maybe this program that's like you know if they're not depending on the demographic they're clearly not te there's gaps in education well we yeah, know that there's sure, gaps sure. in education no matter what yeah yeah definitely definitely yeah 
Yeah. Um, Nightingale, do you maybe want to speak a little bit about your experience coming from growing up around Toronto uh, with your, you know, your connection to cultural communities? Yeah, so I mostly uh, hung around the Chinatown area as it was in a way like a safe refuge for my parents as, you know, Chinatown is a place where you can literally navigate without knowing a lick of English. And my parents, they obviously do not speak Chinese, but they can still navigate just fine. And so it was a Im way to immerse in different, like immerse essentially into my Asianness. So traveling around different parts of the globe, I would always try to seek out a Chinatown to pretty much find like a safe space. And it's just crazy how I've always thought they were eternal part of the fabric of every town essentially. But now with this pandemic, it's made me realize that I've taken it for granted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, I think it's really interesting how there's kind of like so many different Chinatowns across North America and, you know, even in other areas and how they've all had to sort of, you know, come together as kind of like, you know, out of survival, right? Like it came together out of like a need um, because, you know, the community was facing so much racism at the time, uh, both through, you know, other people and through the law. Um, and so I think we can't really have this discussion about, you know, Chinatowns and, um, you know, Asian community spaces without really talking about issues of displacement and gentrification. Um, and to clarify, gentrification is um, kind of like the process of develop targeting racialized communities for development. And through that, like pushing out the community that built and maintained this, com this area, um, you know, for example, you you bulldoze a restaurant and put up a condo and charge ridiculous prices that the existing community can't afford to continue living there and they get further and further pushed out. Um, so that's a little summary of gentrification. Um, so I think Keith, you've had the most experience with, um, you know, Chinatown and you were speaking about it before. Um, and I think you've also been around kind of like the Save Chinatown movement, which isn't isn't new, which I, I didn't know that. <laughs> I was kind of like coming from before, before I was coming from like, oh, like this is a new thing, uh, but it actually has more history than I realized. Uh, would you like to speak a bit about that? Um, okay, it, I mean, way back in those days, um, you know, it was quite different, but uh, what happened is um, the Toronto City Hall, the new, what they call the new City Hall, was built in uh, the 60s, you know, it's actually built right on top of the residential part of Chinatown. And they just expropriated people and didn't give them fair market value. And then they built the city hall there and people just sort of went along with it because, you know, they, they know if you raise your voice, uh, something bad might happen. And then uh, in uh, the late 60s, they were gonna bulldoze, um, the um, commercial part of Chinatown on Dundas. And uh, that was the plan. And that's when they said it was an eyesore and these developers wanted to make a parking lot for the Eaton Center. And, but the community, this time they got together, they knew, you know, they had stood by and watched this other thing happen. And they went and they, they organized and they went down to Chinatown and, and they organized a meeting with the politicians and it was a special day. Everybody knew about it and they went down in the gallery and then like, you know, my cousin spoke, Mrs. Jean Lum spoke, all these community leaders and they spoke about, you know, the Chinese community and the uh, contributions they had made and the sacrifices and the, some of the suffering and things like that. And it was all new to the politicians, like they had never, heard about this you know they just thought this this eyesore you know let's get rid of it and uh, so they they backed off so the community won and um, you know that was uh, an important so we still have Chinatown and and the Chinatown moved west uh, from near Bay and Elizabeth to uh, to Spadina and Dundas um, and but it's still you know it's still there and, and um, so that was, um, you know, and now with gentrification, uh, you know, I guess it's very similar things happening more in a piecemeal. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I don't, I, like you can't, you can't say only Chinese people should live in an area in a neighborhood. You can't say that, but um, you know, uh, destroying, destroying a, 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 a neighborhood and, and just putting a condo, like there has to be, um, there has to be some voice that can push back against it. They didn't do that in Kensington market. Um, you know, they see the value of it. And uh, so there are some neighborhoods that, uh, that, are, that should be, that should be preserved if possible, but it's a way of how does that work? Uh, you know, working out how that happens uh, so that everybody uh, benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think what you're saying is really interesting about kind of balancing that like, well, we can't say, you know, only Chinese people should live here and everything has to be Chinese. And I think, um, you know, I think Nightingale and I were having a bit of a conversation about this before um, in terms of when, you know, gentrification is, you know, Chineseness is used as an excuse for gentrification. Um, you know, we were joking about big boba franchises taking over. Um, so Nightingale, do you want to speak a little bit about uh, that sort of nuance? Sure. So I think that it kind of just comes down to what we understand of Asian-ness, if that makes sense, because if the identity of a Chinatown is where a boba shop is, then do we really understand what community and cultural spaces are? So I think that's kind of like the other question we need to address before addressing that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I think, um, you know, it's important to consider that Chinatown is, was built by working class Chinese people. And, um, you know, saying, calling it, you know, dragon something, you know, that doesn't, mm. if it's displacing the local community, that doesn't make it not gentrification. Um, and like, I know with uh, Friends of Chinatown, for example, they've been um, involved in a site fight over 315 to 325 Spadina, uh, which is where Roll San and Ding Dong Bakery, and I think there's Vietnamese optometrist and multiple culturally specific and affordable businesses are. Um, and I think the, um, the perspective that a lot of when they go to the community consultation that a lot of the developers have is that, you know, we just, we're just thinking of aesthetics. We just want it to look Chinese. Their solution is like, oh, let's just like paint a mural with like a geisha on it or something. And then they can check off their, their cultural checkbox um, instead of like, you know, actually, you know, taking, acknowledging the needs of, of the community. Um, so Josh, I, sorry. Oh, I think to add to that, I think that there's also a very huge language barrier as the elderly workers of Chinatown, they don't really speak a lick of English and there's so many documents that are out there that are all in English. So how, what are they going, they are not going to read it. And so how are they going to contribute to asking how can we reshape Chinatown, move forward with all these developments if there, if there's no other contributions from the insiders? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know like with, you know, my example with Friends of Chinatown, one of the big things they did was they made like a parody version of the notice sign that was saying there's going to be a development there and based, and that parody sign was, you know, gave a message about community and Chinatown and it was also translated in, um, into Chinese. And what happened, you know, after all this fighting is, you know, the city put up their same like notice sign that still says this building is going to be demolished but they translated it into Chinese and that's the first time Toronto has had a, a sign in a language other than English. Um, and, you know, of course they're congratulating themselves on that, but it's kind of like, <laughs> but the building is still going <laughs> to be demolished though. Yeah. Um, Josh, do you have any insights maybe like from Vancouver? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think, but then with, with my response to that, that just goes to show like how, I'm not like how different the generational gap is, I guess, with me and Keith and everything. Cause like, sure, I wanna know, know more about Chinatown and all that stuff too, but it just, but then for some reason it just doesn't really cross my mind. So that could, that itself could just even be a statement as to like, you know, why, why we should like really pay more attention to Chinatown in general. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have five minutes to the Q and A. 
Um, do you guys want to say anything else about, you know, the, the concept of gentrification, your opinions, uh, why do these issues matter? Um, and maybe what is our responsibility as artists um, in terms of, um, you know, kind of our role in art washing, which to define means like kind of using art as an excuse for gentrification as of my example with the mural. Um, you know, we keep seeing these things repeated where artists go to a neighborhood because it's a bit cheaper and they can afford it and then it becomes trendy and then the developers move in or developer uses art an artist, they commission a statue and they're able to say, oh, we contributed to culture. And so that's why we can, it's not gentrification, we can get away with it. Um, so do you guys maybe want to discuss and share your opinions on our responsibility as artists? Yeah, for sure. I think I do have something to say about that. Like I was reflecting like the other day about like, you know, my role as like an artist here and during, especially during this time during COVID and everything, right? And this applies to a lot of things as well. So I was thinking about like how, how I felt, for some reason I felt like as, as I was going throughout my career as like a filmmaker, I didn't really touch too much on the subject on like, you know, Asian representation, you know, also being proud of being who I am. I, I just happened to tell stories that just so happened to like, you know, feature people with who happen to be Asian, you know, just a very universal story like that front, right? But then like, I just really learned that like, you know, even though I didn't pay too much attention to that, there, there's still an inherent like, you know, Asian-ness to it. So, you know, the, the fact that like a lot of like, my, my work is, tends to stem from like a very Asian perspective on things or, or uh, you know, open the doors to lots of many connections and this also have, uh, okay, let me, let me take this back a bit, okay. So basically the things that I actually, actually really wanna talk about as that would really help with like, you know, uh, talking about Asian representation is the three shuns I would like to call it. There's representation, innovation, and collaboration. So I'm just going to just give like really quick spark notes on that stuff. So representation, obviously, right? Like, you know, being able to see someone who looks just like you or, you know, seeing someone who actually is making art that happens to look just like you, you know? So, you know, it's it, sure it's a very obvious thing, but there's also a sense of empowerment, you know? And, uh, yeah, that's a very, that's a very like Sparkle's version of representation, innovation, meaning like, you know, being able to not, to, to, to stay away from safe art, basically, you know, like to be an innovator is to be, you know, obviously take risks. And frankly, you know, in the art world, I see sometimes in this, especially during this time right now, like it's very safe. And I just see, and then when you look at art from like, you know, the East, like in Asia and Thailand and China and everything, for some reason, like, for example, like *Parasite*, for example, like like that movie, it seems so much so much more innovative, and it happened to break so many rules, and it just happened to be, be awesome, freaking awesome. And that can also apply to a lot of art in general, like painting, you know, poetry, and all that stuff too. So if we have more risk takers who, are like like that, you know, uh, telling stories uh, like that, and it so happened to be you know, you know, Asian, and like being able to tell. Sorry, my 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 mind's kind of like. Cool. Firing all cylinders right now. Basically, the I artist's mind. Back a bit. Yeah, the artist's mind. It's just a lot of things I want to talk about in such a short time. Basically, a new perspective always brings innovation. That's a, that's the second thing I want to talk about for this whole art thing. And the third thing is collaboration. So being able to you know make art like that so wonderfully for everyone to see it just invite naturally invites people who think just like you to make even more awesome stuff. So that I feel will help really push you know. Asian Canadian voices out there in general. So, so let's, for example, like me, if I make a, 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 a film full of Filipino cast and crew, naturally that's going to invite more Filipino cast and crews to, you know, make more awesome Filipino films out there, you know, which I frankly don't see enough of. So being able to apply that to a lot of other things out there, like whether it be like murals, you know, poetry and all that stuff too. Like, I think that's what's really important and I have to see out there. So again, representation, innovation, <laughs> collaboration those are the three shuns i feel are very important in archiving Canadian content so yeah we're all gonna leave with a new motto yeah yeah sorry <laughs> that was me just firing all cylinders up in my head so yeah <laughs> the three shuns <laughs> the three shuns t-i-o-n <laughs> yeah sorry I, I took up a lot of your time there but yeah there you go <laughs> no worries it was it was worth it yeah um did keith did you want to add anything i'll, I'll just say um 
the art, um, it holds the community together. It can serve to do that. And, and also these are very, um, it also can nourish the community. So um, I think it's in just very general, um, just in very general terms, those, those two things by creating art, um, this is, these are some of the effects that, that happen. Uh, you know, it holds, it helps the community, people recognize themselves or uh, in certain aspects of their lives in, in, in when people make art. And they, it, it, the art also nourishes uh, the community so that, um, you know, and it holds it together. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, you know, I'll, I'll stop there, I guess. Yeah, no, I think that's like a really important, um, you know, idea that like this, that's the importance of art. That's, that's why we have it. Uh, okay. Nightingale, do you have anything to add? Oh, that's so much pressure. I'm the last one. Anyway, so I feel that grabbing different perspectives is very, very important, but also grabbing another perspective from a different voice is also just as compelling. I feel that it, it doesn't build, it doesn't bridge the gap, but rather it builds a bridge instead to open up a whole other audience. It also creates a source of empowerment, especially from community and from community creates um, collaboration. And if we harness all of those different things, we do create innovation to bring forth like common perspectives that we think is common, but we can bring it to the forefront for everyone else to understand such as Parasite how it is such a slice of the universe that is very Asian, but then when, because it was so authentic and true and it was such a unique perspective, even though it's such a common story about different classes and e e economic statures, when you bring it up to the forefront, people are like, this is still unique, but it's also just as compelling because it's a whole different perspective with a different voice. Hmm. And the thing I inherently like about that is that it's the fact that it's, in, it's an inherently human story. And that can apply to a lot of stories in the East as well. Sure, but these characters just so happen to be, you know, Asian, you know, Thai, Filipino, Japanese, it doesn't matter. As long as the story is like human, you know, there's a beating heart in there. That's, that's what I really like, like strive for, like in that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to piggyback off of the whole concept of being human, that's also what the QQ is also about because like these are all human experiences that is being documented and also like, I think that's also something that we should think about with our cultural spaces is that our cultural spaces are parallel to our human experiences because what we do to our spaces is pretty much interconnected, if that makes sense. That if we forget about our physical spaces, what's gonna happen to our spaces in our community as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually have the Q&A now, uh, which means that we can respond to questions that have been upvoted in the Q&A box. Uh, so I'll read the question and then kind of like ask one of you. Um, so it says, first one here, this question might be more appropriate for Keith, but open to anyone. What are the differences in terms of community and culture, if any, between the various Chinatowns, including Spadina, Dundas, Broadview, Aging Court, Richmond Hill, Markham, et cetera? Wow. Um, I think, um, I think they're, um, they are different for sure. Um, part, partly, um, partly because of um, they've developed in different ways. Um, I, I mean, Spadina, um, Spadina Dundas, it's, it's a lot of mom and pop uh, type businesses. And, um, you know, something like um, uh, in Scarborough, you know, there's more, uh, there's more, um, you know, bigger, you know, TNT and, and other, um, other uh, types of businesses. Um, I think, I think the really the Chinatowns, they, they have, a, you know, there's a similar culture uh, but um, and they're all different because they're in different neighborhoods. I mean, it's a very tough question. It's a very interesting question um, because Toronto has uh, maybe four or five Chinatowns, uh, and uh, and they are they all have their own 
a specific kind of personality and and feel to them and um and I think it's it's um, you know when you go when you go into them you can you can experience them and they're they're quite they're all different and but there's also uh, similarities like very you know cultural similarities so um, yeah it's a it's a very hard thing uh, to define you know uh, you know that this China one China Gerard Chinatown is different to uh, Spadina Chinatown. Um, and, and exactly how and why um, it's 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 difficult to say, and it has it has to do with they've developed um, they've developed uh, in different ways over over time from a different start, and um, yeah, I don't I, that would be an interesting uh, you know uh, subject of research. Um, yeah. I don't that's about it for that as far as my comments. If anyone else has anything. Yeah, I think that would be a really interesting like research topic. I think um, Nightingale, do you actually have anything to add? Because I think we were having a similar conversation relating to um, you know the differences between maybe like Toronto downtown Chinatown and more so like the suburban Chinatown or Asian neighborhoods. Yeah, I remember having this conversation. Chinatown, like the main part, which we all know, the popularized one in on Spadina. That one has is like very apparently Chinese, like it's just right in your face. Whereas when you drive away to, I guess, a semi not access easy to accessible place like Richmond Markham Hill. I mean, Richmond Hill Markham. <laughs> um, it's you just don't really see it right away, and so that's just the really interesting part about those two different Chinatowns and how you can see that in the one in downtown Toronto, it's more affordable whereas the other place you do get the better food but the price is also very different and also the way of life such then some Chinatown downtown is more for the working class. Mm. Um, so the next question here what would be your best advice for aspiring Asian Canadian artists? Um, Josh do you want to take this one? Yeah for sure for sure. So my best advice just for art in general also actually as an Asian Canadian would be just to like, if you have an idea, just do it, you know, straight up. Like a lot of people can kind of get stuck in their head being afraid of like not being able to do what they want to do. But really all you got to do is just put pen to paper and just start writing or, you know, get your camera, get your phone and start shooting. Work with what you have and really don't, don't mind what people think of you. Just, just make something that you want to see put into, out into this world, you know? Because who knows, people are really going to vibe with what you what you have to say because everyone has a different perspective on life, right? And especially as an Asian Canadian, we have such a very unique perspective on things, especially with like, you know, the, the, the quarantine and COVID and, uh, and all that stuff. Just having an idea and being able to act on it and just having the drive to really want to see it out there in the world will get you very far. Just the act of doing, really. That's so, that is my, that is my uh, advice. Asian Canadian content creators up there. If I may add, I think that one of the biggest examples, it would be our mentorship program as we invited people who did not have like a lot of ability to like create the videos, who people who essentially wanted to contribute in their own way, but didn't know how. And honestly, I just felt like it was just a lot of encouragement and just listening that invited their creativity to be able to tell authentic stories. Keith, Josh, you're free to jump in to oh, agree yeah. or disagree with me totally, with what's yeah. happening. I'm, I'm just blown away by how like how many awesome stories are out there that are just waiting to be told. And all this needs is a little push from someone just to be able to like say, oh yeah, that's an awesome idea. Go ahead and do it. And they end up doing it and it just turns out amazing, you know? So there's a lot of like stories hidden in your hearts, hidden in your, in your heads, just waiting to be told out there. And I'm really excited to see them. To all the people out there so yeah mm -hmm. yeah just to add to that i would just say um you know follow your heart follow your passion you know do what you feel you want to do as an artist yeah mm -hmm. one more thing i want to add i think that this mentorship program after really reflecting on it it really brings up the question of we do need something like this like we do need more mentorship in terms of 
inviting people to be able to tell their stories. And it does go to show that we do need more diverse voices to be archived and we just need opportunities and platforms to be able to showcase them. Mm. Nice. Um, so the next question, so it says, there's definitely a generational shift between the panelists. It seems to me that the older Save Chinatown movement didn't organically evolve into today's movement against anti-Asian racism. What can we do to bring these generations together in a meaningful way to build a stronger case for preserving Chinese Canadian culture? Um, do any of you have any burning answers? You wanna jump in? Well, just, just for- <laughs> I think, uh, I'm gonna shoot this to Keith. I think Keith knows the answer to this one. <laughs> no, I would just say uh, to people of my generation, um, um, welcome the younger generation and learn from them as much as possible. They have, they have um, a lot to, to teach us and, um, you know, don't, you know, it's, it's important to, uh, that uh, the generations don't, um, don't have that uh, gap or conflict somehow. Um, and um, I think, I think the sentiments are there and they're very similar. Um, and, but the way of expressing them might be different. Um, but I, but I think, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, I, I, um, it's a good question. Uh, what do you think, Josh? Uh, I don't know. I actually wanted to ask you a question actually, because as for me, as someone who's not as like, you know, educated in like the whole, uh, in, in the Chinatown movement and everything, I'm asking what can I do as a young person who's not educated as myself to be able to, you know, help save Chinatown in the distress that it's having right now. It's like, you know, well, what can I do? What can, what can people like me who are not educated help out? Um, well, you're doing it, Josh. You're, you know, you're taking part in this uh, organization, in this uh, quorum and, uh, you know, and you're making art and I think um, you're making films. And, and I think, um, you know, if, if you, you go, go where your heart is and then, uh, you know, the, the work will follow and, and uh, that will that will have an effect on on the on the the world on the culture. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it, it's weird because, like, again, as I said before, like, like my my drive for Asian representation wasn't inherently something that I wanted to start off with, and I, I don't really contribute a lot of my early success to the fact that like I'm that the fact that I'm Asian. It's the fact that I just wanted to make stories and everything, right? But then looking back at my own work, again, it just happens to be, my work just happens to be Asian inherently because I am an Asian person and it's happened to have Asian people in it. I happen to have Asian crew in it. It just opened up so many uh, connections that I never really, you know, I, that, kind of, that I kind of took for granted. So that in a way that kind of really opened my eyes to, you know, really being, really being proud of like who I am as like an Asian person and, you know, just trying to pave the way for people who want to be artists like myself to really, you know, fight for, representation, like what I'm doing right now. So yeah, that's, that's something I wanted to comment on. Yeah. yeah, like I think there's a lot of interest around the younger generation, maybe trying to, um, you know, come back to Chinatown, like to continue and inherit and what does that mean? And, you know, how, like, how can we learn uh, from maybe the older generations um, and then do our part to kind of, you know, dream up the future. I think it's been like a really interesting uh, conversation to have and just something to think about. Um, if we're ready to move on to the next question, it says, this one says, what are some resources that you would recommend for learning more about the history of Asian Canadian communities in Toronto slash Ontario? Um, is there any one of you that wants to take this? Let me pull up Wikipedia real quick. Uh, I'm not kidding. I, I, I'm for, sorry, this is for Toronto, Ontario. So I'm, I don't think I have anything much to say about that. Do you have any for Vancouver? Frankly, no. <laughs> not right now, unfortunately. That doesn't really come to mind, but I probably do somewhere. Um, I, I would say there's, I mean, there's a, really a lot of material and there's more and more every day. And there's writers. Um, there's a lot of people writing books. So, uh, um, and, and they even teach... Uh, teach uh, uh, Chinese Canadian or Asian Canadian studies in universities now. 
as as everyone knows. So I think I think those resources do exist, and it's it's just searching and and finding the things that are relevant to you and to your to the questions that you have in in your own that you are asking in you know in your own mind. Um, there are a lot of uh, resources um, now for for um, understanding the community and and um, and then uh, you can make your own contributions to that as well as a, as community members. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, a resource I can suggest is that Friends of Chinatown Toronto NT Base is hosting um, a virtual version of Arlene Chan's uh, talk, which is uh, it's called the Chinese in Toronto Then and Now, uh, which will be on December 5th. And I think that's going to be linked into the chat. Um, so the next question is for Keith. It says, what is the connection between Chinese and Jewish communities in Chinatown? Yes, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, it's very close back in the day. Um, the, um, my, my father, he spoke Yiddish, like that was the language of the Jewish community. So he spoke Yiddish. He grew up, he was born in uh, Kensington Market. So he was born in Toronto more than 100 years ago. And that was, Kensington was a Jewish area. Spadina was Jewish. And um, so there was this kind of, uh, I guess he spoke Yiddish and he, there was a strong, there was a strong thing with the two communities. Um, I, I did some uh, videos for uh, the legal society and, you know, things like, they didn't, uh, okay, if you were Chinese, you might get into law school. Okay, you get into law school, you get your law degree, but you have to article. And no law firm would take a Chinese person in those days, but a Jewish law firm would take a Chinese person. So um, the first Chinese lawyers articled with Jewish law firms. And the same with my father, he was the first... Uh, Chinese pharmacist in uh, east of the Rocky Mountains, and uh, and uh, you know he he apprenticed with a Jewish um, drugstore, you know, so there was a very um, there was this this kind of uh, I don't know what you know it's in undefinable, but uh, my my father was a a goy a Sabbath goy. So that was a non-Jewish person who would go in on the Jewish Sabbath and do the things that you, the Jewish people weren't allowed to do on the, on the like work. Like he would light the, the, the fire for, his, for their stoves and things like that. And, and that was, uh, you know, there was, and then Jews were the first people who discovered Chinese food. So I remember I was down at my dad's store in Chinatown and there was a Jewish holiday I don't know much about it, but there's a Jewish holiday where um, people fast and then they break their fast. And, the, and that where they break the fast, oh my goodness, we looked out the window, all the, all the restaurants, there were huge lineups and none of the people were Chinese. They're all Jewish and they were lined up and uh, to, to get into the Chinese restaurants so that they could eat. And, and I remember some of the old, old, Chinese, the low Q, they would say, oh, if it wasn't for the Jews, um, I would have starved to death, like, be, you know, if they had a restaurant. So the, it's an interesting question. There was um, this community, I guess they were both outsiders back in those days, and they both had similar values, like they believed in education, and they were, they sort of the street smarts, like my dad, you know, he admired, uh, you know, he learned a lot from from uh, his Jewish friends and things like that, um, and and they lived together in the in the ward that that uh, that one neighborhood where immigrants lived long long ago. Um, you know the the Chinese and the Jews were sort of um, yeah. That's it's an interesting question, um, and and um, yeah, there was some there is some funny connection way back in those days, um, just, just really a lot, uh, 
you know, I remember the store, they had Jewish customers and there was this one old lady that we used to call Bubi. And, and Bubi, I think in Yiddish means grandma. And then one of the, one of the Chinese women who worked at the store, she said she was riding on the streetcar on the Dundas streetcar going near Spadina, which was a Jewish area at the time. And then she saw this lady get on the streetcar and she said, oh, hi, Bubi. And uh, the whole streetcar just erupted into laughter because here is this Chinese person saying, oh, hi, grandma, to this Jewish lady. And they just thought it was uh, really funny. And so there's a lot, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing. Like, it's just uh, like there was some kind of weird, weird mm -hmm. connection. Yes, well, I'll okay. stop there, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, like it's a very oh, interesting, no, yeah. Like, you know, you paint a really full picture and I think it speaks a lot to, um, you know, the importance of building relationships across cultural communities. Um, so that's actually all the time we have for the questions. So I'm going to like, first of all, thank our lovely panelists. Um, but if there's any like last words that you guys want to share um, a last thought, something to wrap up on. Um, why don't we start with Nightingale? Well, again, I just want to thank everyone who's attending. I just want to thank the panelists since we're all mentors and everybody and our mentees, the artists without everyone, essentially this would not have happened. So thank you. And I would like to end with a quote. It's something that's been, I've been carrying with me for like a while and it, a really important quote, I think, I would like to share with everyone. It is from The Language of Appeasement by D.L. Stewart. Diversity asks, who's in the room? Equity responds, who is trying to get in the room but can't? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? Inclusion asks, has everyone's ideas been heard? Justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority? Diversity asks, how many more racialized groups do we have in this year than last? Equity responds, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as the perpetual majority here? Inclusion asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel they belong? Justice challenges, whose safety is being sacrificed and minimalized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining dehumanizing views? Wow. That's a great quote. Yeah. Um, Keith, do you want to go next for last thoughts? Um, just uh, thank you to everybody. And again, um, I'm really uh, blown away that uh, this, you know, you've put this together and, and it's so interesting. And thank you for letting me take part. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for taking part. We've really benefited from your insights. Oh. Um, Josh, do you have any last Asking any, do you have any last words? That sounds kind of morbid. Do you have any last Ooh, thoughts, <laughs> <laughs> wrap up thoughts? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much to uh, my Zoom Toronto and uh, T Base for having me. This is such, this is such an amazing experience getting to work uh, with uh, our mentees. Shout out to our mentees. You guys are amazing. Uh, and I also am very grateful to be a part of this whole panel in general, right? So again, I just want to leave off with like the, the three shuns again. Represent, oh, for every, art piece you do. Remember, there's representation, especially as Asian Canadians, representation, innovation, and collaboration. Always remember all that stuff, okay? And just keep creating, okay? Especially right now, during this whole, this whole, um, this whole uh, quarantine, everything, there's momentum, especially as Asian creators, right? So we got to keep pushing, keep going, and eventually, you know, we're going to make it out there. So yeah, keep fighting. <laughs> That's a great way to wrap up. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it back to Nadine now. Thank you so much. Um, please stick around. I know we're wrapping up, but please do stick around because um, at the end of the program, we are gonna provide a sneak peek of some of the stories and content that will be featured on the Quarantine Capsule Digital Exhibit. Um, but of course, before we show that to you, we can't end without um, giving a huge thank you uh, to our panelists, Nightingale, Keith, Joshua, of course, our moderator, Chris, um, our ASL interpreters and our live captioner, 
Um, thank you again to T-Base for um, bringing this very important opportunity to Myzeum and for partnering with us on, on um, a, a, a very exciting project. Um, thank you to our audience. Uh, for, staying, for joining us tonight. Um, the Quarantine Capsule Digital Exhibit is coming very soon. So there'll be a link in the chat uh, that will take you to that digital uh, sneak peek um, of the digital archive. Um, to keep up with uh, our upcoming events, please be sure to sign up uh, for our newsletter. Um, if you have a Toronto story that you would like to share with us, please drop us an email at info at um, And uh, with that said, um, we'll leave you now with a, a little bit of a peek at what's in store for the Quarantine Capsule digital exhibit. As a child, I always had an interest in the art of paper folding, or commonly known as origami. Regardless of the paper size, I loved the way how each fold brought about a sequence of new shapes and to find a sense of dimensionality. I know she's acting out generations and generations of cooking recipes and techniques passed on from my grandma. I got on the job search. I didn't know, none of us knew, that this thing would change our lives and society. Jobs dried up. How present is care? How reciprocal is vulnerability? How honest is trust? How courageous is love? Communal and social gatherings were now a thing of the past. And something as simple as the act of karaoke or jamming with your family and friends was something that was found to be deeply missed and even taken for granted in the past. Wash my hands for two whole minutes just to hold you need. So can we quarantine and chill? Hi, I'm Melody. I'm a first generation Cambodian Canadian. My mother is a refugee who came over in the late 70s and her exploration of her new world um, is very much the heart of my creative process.